Hello and welcome to Calvary Church Online. My name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the church, and I'm so glad you're joining us today, especially if you're joining us for the first time. If that's you and this is your first time joining us, go ahead and click the welcome tab. Let us know who you are, and one of our team members will connect with you later on in the week, and we have a small gift to send you as a token of our appreciation. And I want to thank our entire Calvary Church family. It's because of your generosity that the ministry of Calvary remains strong here, at home, and abroad. So if you'd like to continue to partner with us, you can do so by following the information at the bottom of the screen. And giving is safe and easy. All right, Calvary, it's time. Let's worship. My song will be I'm living in freedom You're taking my burdens away Jesus forever My song will be Only for you The cross that you bore And the debt that you paid you want over death and the grave This is the reason I say For the hope that you give And the joy that you bring For the promise that heaven is waiting for me This is the reason I say silence I'll testify of your grace Jesus forever my song will be only for you for the cross that you bore and the death that you paid for the victory you won over death and the grave this is the and I say for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring the promise that heaven is waiting for me this is the reason I say
the Lord wanted to remind us of something. He wanted to remind us of his faithfulness to us. And so he brought some scripture to mind. I'm gonna read some short scriptures. And I just encourage you, grab onto the one that resonates the most for you. And I pray that it will be a blessing to you. Starting with Psalm 33, verse four, it says, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all that he does. Psalm 36, five, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the skies. Psalm 89.2, I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Psalm 119.90, your faithfulness, Lord, continues through generations. You established the earth and it endures. Isaiah 25.1, this is actually one of my favorite verses. It says, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things that you planned long ago. So Calvary, this morning, I just want to encourage you, if you're facing something and you need to see the faithfulness of God in your life, you need to see his hand moving. First of all, you're definitely not alone in that. But secondly, I want you to know that he specifically told us to remind you that he is faithful, that he is here and present. And as we continue to worship, let's make a choice. Let's make a choice to turn our eyes to him, to just focus in on him, not spend time this morning thinking about the circumstances, the people involved, but instead just the God that is involved in your life. Let's sing.
Jesus. Thank you.
take a few moments to prepare our hearts, prepare ourselves to partake in the Lord's Supper, to celebrate communion together. The, the instruction that we are given is to examine ourselves, to take time and reflect. And it's an opportunity for us to really stop and take time and reflect on what Jesus has done in our lives. It's an opportunity to respond in gratitude for everything that Jesus has accomplished already and to look forward to the future hope that we have of everything that Jesus has promised to us. And it's because he's already kept every single one of his promises and he continues to keep his promises. He is faithful. So as we look back and remember what Jesus accomplished on the cross 2,000 years ago, we recognize that as he hung there, he paid the price for our wrongdoings, for our moral failures, for our sin. And he did it so that we could be brought into his family. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed so that a new covenant could be written. One that's not about what we do and, and how we accomplish things. It's, it's about what Jesus has done and has already accomplished. And the only way I can think to respond is thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. And I look forward to the future hope of all that you have promised. So let's read these words and partake of these emblems and remember Jesus' amazing sacrifice. Paul records that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. In the same way, after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's receive together. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your amazing sacrifice, for your amazing love. We thank you for what you have accomplished in each one of our lives, what you accomplished 2,000 years ago, and what you accomplished when we met you at whatever point that was in our lives. And we look forward to the future hope of eternity with you where the effects of sin are completely removed and we get to enjoy eternity free from the burden and the effects of sin. We thank you that all of our moral failures and wrongdoings hung to the cross with you and that you paid the price. We love you so much. In your name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you are looking for someone to partner with you in prayer, our prayer team is online live right now, and you can click that live prayer button and someone will connect with you and pray with you. Okay, now let's get some hearts in the chat and hear from today's speaker. Welcome to week one of the new Proverbs series. My name is Vince, and I will be your host for week one. Uh, excited to be uh, here and back in the saddle so quick. It's a very fantastic book and a little bit of a, a fun journey that we're going to go through. We'll be Over the next four weeks, we'll be taking a look at just a, a smattering of Proverbs and little points of interest. But today, I wanted to, I'll start off with 
uh, some origin stories on where this all, the book of Proverbs comes from, and then we'll, we'll dip into a, a few Proverbs to help give it some application. Uh, pause with me, would you, and let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would use this time, open our ears to what you have for us, all the other stuff, the cares of the world, let us put it aside for 30 minutes. Lord, speak to our hearts that we would hear from you, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Proverbs. Proverbs is a collection of anecdotes, uh, little sayings, uh, small stories, very short put together uh, uh, collection, a compilation of books primarily written by Solomon, who was the son of David and Bathsheba. Uh, it, it also has uh, the author uh, Agur and uh, uh, King Lemuel also did uh, chapter 31. So of them, 1 to 29, Solomon, 30, Agur, 31, King Lemuel. Now, how did Solomon get all of these uh, wisdom pieces together? It's uh, said that he wrote over uh, 3,000 uh, proverbs and 1,000 songs. He's an avid writer, um, but it's kind of his own journey on how he got to this point. Well, many of us know the story of David and Bathsheba and, and kind of what brought you know, things to that point. And Solomon was the son who lived, and the Lord had something special uh, going on for him that was unlike any, anything anyone had ever experienced before, or it says would ever experience again, with how, uh, how much knowledge and wisdom he would have. And here we'll jump in. Uh, just briefly, uh, 1 Kings uh, 3 and 11. Now, what Solomon had asked for was uh, he, uh, the Lord came to Solomon in a dream. And the Lord said to him, tell me, like, what... Tell me anything. What is it you want, and it's yours? Tell me what you want, and it's yours. The Lord was so baffled with Solomon's response that he said, what you've asked for, I'm going to give you that, but I'm going to give you these other things too because I'm so blown away by your, your maturity in the whole thing. He says, you have asked for wisdom, not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor for the death of your enemies, but instead for discernment in, a, in administering justice. Make me, he wanted to be made smart to govern the Lord's people. And the Lord was like, that, that is so outstanding. Uh, you know, sometimes we think in that, like uh, the magic lamp and, and, and rubbing, waiting for the genie to come out. And what would we ask for? And so, you know, common things, uh, make me richer beyond rich, make me a, a prince, make me a, a person of, of, like, noteworthy, so I, I have uh, popularity and admiration and love of the people. Uh, wipe out the people who are against me. Make me live for forever. And Solomon came with, help me be wise so I can administer justice to the people. Lord was super impressed. But it doesn't mean that Solomon always acted on the wisdom that the Lord gave him. In fact, uh, there, there's all sorts of funny stories. Uh, in the end, I think Solomon had like uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines. And, uh, you know, a bunch of the opening uh, proverbs are like, don't get messed up in adultery. And so it's, uh, it, it's just kind of like a, a funny take on he had a certain lifestyle things that, you know, he, uh, weaknesses that he, he bowed to, but that the Lord had gave him the smarts to not do it. I find that uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, interesting little side story. It's uh, um, only partially mentioned in, in the scripture, 1 Kings 10, uh, 13, and another piece in 2 Chronicles 9, 12. That King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for. And more. And it's like, oh, and more. Well, you start going through, and so there's the story of Solomon, the wisest man, he's not making mistakes, right? He's, he's, he's King Solomon the wise. And so he turns out that he has this thing for the queen of Sheba. Wealthy, she comes and brings him all sorts of, of gifts and precious things and uh, beautiful bounty. And so she comes along and, and brings these things. And it says that he gave her more than, in return than that. Uh, but he gave her everything she asked. 
And it's a, a, an Ethiopian Jewish uh, tradition that she had a son by him. But she came to the palace and said, like, here's all these gifts, but no hanky-panky. This is not happening. Um, the Queen of Sheba, this, is, this isn't going on. But Solomon, using his, his, his devious and, and his, his wisdom, he started off the evening before anyone got there by putting a drink on the bedside table. He said, stay the night. I, there won't be any hanky-panky, but you can't take anything from my, king, from my kingdom. So he fed her this amazing spicy dinner, uh, a dinner uh, filled with, with spices. She had a great time, party atmosphere. She comes in to spend the evening. No, no, no funny business. No hanky-panky is going to happen. But her mouth is on fire. And he says, if you, if you take even anything from my kingdom, then the deal's over. And so, sure enough, uh, so none of that is recorded that way in the scripture. It's, a, it's a, one of those, uh, it's not even an urban legend. It's an oral tradition in, in the Ethiopian Jews, the, the son of the queen of Sheba, and that the dad is Solomon. It's, it's, it's the, telling the story that even though he was the wisest of men, that he still did dumb junk. And it, it helps, uh, you know, like his father before him, who also did dumb junk, uh, it, it, it's a, it kind of sets that track record for uh, setting an expectation. What is wisdom? What is that all about? Where does it begin? And let's get into it. Proverbs 1, 1 to 7, and this will be up for you to read. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and discipline, for comprehending words of insight and for receiving instruction in wise living and in righteousness, justice, and equity. To impart prudence to the simple and knowledge uh, and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and gain instruction and the discerning acquire wise counsel by understanding the Proverbs and parables, the sayings, and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Well, kind of as we start unfolding some things, Proverbs raises uh, some fantastic ethics questions, some things that are sometimes hard for us to hear, because sometimes when we're reading into them, we're like, I think I'm being called a fool. And, 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 and so you have to kind of get your, your fortitude on that the Lord has this, this high benchmark of, of, of his values, of his ideals, but not even Solomon nor his father before him, was able to hit the mark, but he gave it a spin. Proverbs raises questions of values, uh, moral behavior, the meaning of, of life, right conduct, and its theological foundation is based in the fear of God. And, you know, if you've heard that phrase, you know, put the fear of God into you. That, that person had just had the fear of God in him. And, and it, sometimes fear is like, you know, equated negatively. It's more like a, an, an, an awe, a, a respect, a, uh, an acknowledgement of authority, um, as opposed to I'm afraid of God. It's a, like, magnitude of God kind of respect. And so the beginning of knowledge begins at that point of understanding the awe and the reverence of the Lord. Now, before we get into some examples, there's one kind of key grounding thing that is the key point to success as laid out in Proverbs. Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, this is the Bible talking, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows out of it. Guard your heart, for everything you do flows out of it. Uh, the premise is taken further in the Gospels by, by Jesus in, in the parables, where often examples of, like, the sower and, and the seed. Um, the seed was planted in his heart, you know, and, and, and it grew, you know, the five, ten, a hundred times. Or be careful that, you know, that there's not weeds in your heart uh, so that it can't grow or that the, the weeds choke out the good growing thing. And so it's out of the heart that the abundance flows. It's out of the heart uh, th that uh, the fruit is born. Uh, trust comes out of the heart. It's, it's, it's the cultivation spot. And so things get rolling with Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, guard your heart, 
for everything you do flows out of it. Have you ever been a, you know, I take this as an example where, like, trust. And sometimes when a situation pop up, pops up and you feel like, I don't trust this situation, I don't trust the person, I, I don't trust. It could even be something, like, uh, like uh, trivial or stupid. It's like, when you can't find the remote. Uh, maybe that happened to you this morning when you went to flip on the video. And you can't find the remote, and you're like, do you have the remote? And you point to that other person in the room. It's like, no, I don't have the remote. Huh. Are you sitting on the remote? I, I don't think I'm sitting on the remote. Huh. Okay, get up. And you've just got, your trust is, is, is for whatever reason has happened in life, you were cultivated with a, a, a distrust. Perhaps that person has messed with you one too many times, one too many uh, things has popped up where you're like, ah, yeah, I don't just, I, I don't trust you. And out comes something born out of that mistrust. And it happens, you know, in, in these trivial things, but it happens in, in business. It, it, it happens in uh, your workplace. It happens with family and relationships. These little things that are happening along the way in your personal journey is your heart. And that cultivating, so the encouragement from the Proverbs is guard your heart. Cultivate it for whatever you, uh, however well you tend it, out of it will flow the next thing. Trust, uh, as, as an example. If, if, if it's filled with mistrust, you got that weeding process to do in order to make sure you don't get a place where you're yelling at your family because you don't trust them. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic illustration. It's such a, an oddity. But I got to squeeze this one in, in, in here because I'm sick like that. Proverbs 18, 17. In a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone cross-examines. It's the fantastic, uh, of course, for those of you who, uh, you know, are in or pay a little attention on, on the news or you, your, your TikTok or your YouTube has been flooded with Johnny Depp Amber Heard stories. What happened there? Uh, you, you've got this, the, the situation that is blown apart. And, uh, you know, the, it all came down today where, where he won the defamation case, but I, I don't know who really wins in this story. It's, a, it's a overall a, a very sad tale of, you know, of, of, of viciousness. And, but when it came up, you hear that first testimony. And these are the types of things that you'll find in a proverb. These little nuggets for life. In a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right. The first person to get to mum or dad... Why do you want to be first? Because you want to tell your side of the story, and then the other person has to not only defend themselves, but that story, which is often a half-baked story. You want to get, be the one to get to something uh, first, um, which is a understanding as well that other people are going through other things, and it's not always as clear-cut as only understanding half of a story. It's part of our responsibility to try and, and, and pick out all the pieces. Some people are just a, a little neurotic or have something going on. I think it's because uh, they're both vegans. And if you haven't eaten meat in a few years, that'll do that to you. That's exactly what's going on. Which, as an aside, if two vegans are having a rivalry with one another, is it still called a beef? I just want you to think about that. If nothing else is taken away today, just think about that. You see, these, these, these proverbs, these little nuggets from Solomon are here to help you navigate. Uh, they're just like, they're, they're, there's little tidbits. Um, and so jump in, fill in with your own stories the things that maybe impact you. I'm just going to go through, uh, uh, you know, three or four uh, just little quick proverbs, uh, you know, make comment on them, and we'll, get, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up from there. Proverbs 18.2, 18.2. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Hmm. Proverbs 12, 16. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. Oh, man, I was downtown with a, a buddy, and, and he got me tickets, uh, tickets for he and I to go see a, a, 
uh, a band at the Vogue. And so I was like, sure. He, you know, he doesn't know Jesus and I love him. And so I'm like, man, this sounds like a fun time. Let's go hang out. We'll go to the Vogue. We'll go see your band. We get down there and, 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 and he had a bit of a week and he's uh, packing back some drinks. And I, I can tell he's just kind of, things are heading that way for him. And, and that's kind of how the, the night is progressing. Well, after, after the show was done, he's like, hey, do you want to pop in a restaurant, grab a bite to eat? It's like, yeah, buddy, we're already downtown. Let's, let's do it. Let's grab something. He's having a few more drinks, and then he gets into it. He starts lighting up and, and with, uh, with, 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 with the alcohol talk. And this, this is one of those things that can happen. And the next thing you know, it's the, the church this, and the, the church is full of, you know, money-grubbing, you know, you know, losers, and that's what it's all about. It's just a big scheme to get your dollars, and then if you're not a part of that, then you, you're probably a pedophile. And it's like, what? What? And these insults are, are coming out. I'm like, I love the church. I love my church. I, I, these, this isn't how things, like, I didn't do that. But the venom it started coming out, and, and, and the booze was talking. And I'm like, I could, I could hear it. If this is the kind of thing where I jump in to retaliate in a, like, well, you know, and, and lay into him, I'm the fool for arguing with the drunk. I'm the fool for uh, diving in and, and, and taking these things and putting them in my heart like it's against me. Like, I didn't do it. Like, I, you know, of course, there's been terrible atrocities. Things have happened in history. Uh, it wasn't me. I, I, I'd be like saying, I, I didn't, like, a, like a car, uh, crimes with cars. I'd be like, if a crime with a car happened and, you know, it's like, well, you know, you have a car, so you did this. It'd be like someone to try to take my car away when I didn't even commit a car crime. And you're like, how could that ever happen when, you know, someone take away something that where you didn't even do anything wrong? And, and, it, and, and these situations pop up where I didn't do that. But if I jump in, I'm the fool. I'm the fool. And so this is kind of like a little wisdom proverb. Do I let him plant a seed in my heart? Do you let that person with that hurled insult? You see, fools show their annoyance at once. Don't get me wrong, I was annoyed, but I didn't show it. I, w- I wasn't caving to this moment because I know how this, this story goes. So what are we going to be downtown in this fisticuffs and this yelling match over, you know, what the church did and the hospital, you know, and there's St. Paul's, yeah, the evil church. Uh, you know, so it's, it, it's a, it, a tricky place, but I'm not going to engage on that because I'm not an idiot. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. What am I supposed to do? In these situations, I've got examples that Solomon has written out for me to follow in this way. The challenge of our day is thinking that uh, everyone is, 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 is foolish and stupid and that other people's opinions don't matter. I think it's valuable to understand, okay, what is he saying and then I might have thoughts, and, you know, we, and we did talk about it later uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a different environment. But at the time, it's just, it's just not worth the getting into. I, I want to be a prudent, prudent person. I don't want to be, you know, yelling at him and get into, like, being condescending. Um, because condescending, um, it, it's, not, it's not great. That means when you talk down to people, that's what condescending means. Okay. A little something for you. Lighten up the moment. Where do you go with a proverb like that? Don't let a fool plant seeds in your heart. Tend your garden. Above all else, guard your heart. Be prudent. That's what I, I take away. Just a, a little example of that. Now, here's a fascinating one to me. A proverb on hope. Proverbs thirteen twelve. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. The Good News Translation uh, talks about it this way. When hope is crushed, the heart is crushed. When hope is crushed, the heart is crushed. 
Romans 8, 25 says, but if we hope for something we don't have, we wait for it patiently. Now, when we think about things like a, in this delayed gratification, a hope deferred can make the heart sick. It's possible that sometimes when you're waiting for something for too long, you, 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 your faith just tanks out. But when you see the fruit of something, you gotta, you gotta, that act of faith is believing that thing is on the way. That thing is on the way. That answer to prayer, that loved one who is away from Jesus. I, man, I've been praying that prayer for 15 years. I haven't seen it yet. Don't give up your hope. Is when it comes through, a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. It, 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 it's, it springs up something good inside of you. And there's value in that. I moved into my house about 16 years ago. And, you know, we're just broke, you know, doing life. At that point, we had a couple kids, and, you know, it just, it, it is what it is. We, we love each other, love our family, but not a, an extra ton of, of money on the side. Can't boo-hoo. I'm, I'm in a nice house, all the rest of that, but uh, it starts coming up where it's like, well, like, what, what's going to go in, in this room? And my wife and I, we are savers. We, it's not something that we, we struggle uh, crazy with. We can... Uh, you know, kind of bear down and make it happen. So when it came up to furniture for our home, we had some particular things. We knew we could like, you know, hey, you know, so-and-so, I've got an old couch. Do you want that? It's like, we could have. Uh, there were some specific things we wanted to like, these specific, <laughs> these specific couches, and uh, because my dining room space is a little narrower, so I wanted this specific dining room table with the, these specific chairs so I get more chairs in, so I get more people around the table. We had some kind of things li laid out, but we're broke. And so it's one of those conflicting things. Uh, if you're going to be broke, uh, you need to be able to wait. The longing fulfilled is a tree of life. We would have people come over to our house and be like, come, you know, come on in. It's like, and there's just an empty room. Like, this is the main entrance. It's like, there's nothing there. It's like, uh, this is where the couch is going to be. Uh, this over here is the dining room. I know there's no dining room yet, but it's coming. It was like that for, uh, I don't know how many months, a couple of years maybe, uh, where... We refuse, though, to jump in to debt for things. And so you have to be able along the way, if, if you're choosing, I will not go into debt for stuff. There, there's things like uh, your, your, your mortgage that you, you kind of got to bite that bullet and pay that off over time. But just like, you know, the little things, uh, the couch, the whatever, do I need to go into indebtedness for that? Or can I save? That longing fulfilled is a tree of life. When you're saving for something, uh, you know, in and along the way, oh, it's, it's so much more meaningful when that time comes. It's like, yeah, and you like smash the piggy bank open and out come the nickels. There's something valuable about that. Uh, and it's not just my opinion. There was a Stanford, it's called the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. And the gist was that you would give a child a marshmallow. It said at any point in the next 15 minutes, you can eat the marshmallow. <laughs> Excuse me. At any point in the next 15 minutes, you can eat the marshmallow, but if you can wait 15 minutes, I'll give you a second marshmallow. It's the Stanford Marshmallow ex uh, Experiment. The message was small reward now or a bigger reward later. Now, of course, some children broke down and just ate their marshmallow straight away. But there was a group of them that were able to get past it and get that coveted two marshmallows. The interesting part of that story is that amongst the kids who waited when they were reevaluated as teenagers and adults, they demonstrated, uh, the article reads, demonstrated a striking array of advantages over their peers. As teenagers, they had higher SAT scores, higher social competence, self-assuredness, self-worth, and were rated um, as more mature, better able to cope with stress, more likely to plan ahead, and more likely to use reason. And so, whether it was that experiment or the way that their parents, <coughs> excuse me, the way that their parents raised them or, you know, whatever life experience brought them that way, it was a, a, an experiment to show 
that when you waited, you delayed gratification for something, that good things came. And so, Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Little practical lessons on not grabbing whatever your heart wants at the moment, but delaying it. Maybe you're something, that's something that you're working through. That's the encouragement for you. Final one before we conclude today. Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Having enough information requires you often to hear from multiple people and multiple points of view. You don't have to agree with them all, but if you are shut down from listening, that's the challenge. Many advisors will equal success, but plans fail for a lack of putting people around you, trying to go rogue, going solo because you don't have the information. Oh man, I was at a wedding over uh, this last weekend. Our friends Mike and Caitlin got married. So beautiful. Uh, often it's said of a bride that she's glowing. And she was. She was, was radiant. She's totally glowing. Now, if you're to tell me, uh, you know, a young man, I, I met this girl and she's glowing. Well, you know, what do you, what do you think? Well, that's, that, that's part of the information. Um, like, He's like, no, she's like glowing. It's like, well, is she like, like radiating? Yeah, she totally radiates. Well, is this, is this Miss Fukushima? Is this like Miss Chernobyl? Is she glowing because she's filled with radiation? Is that why she's glowing? Like, does she have a nice greeny hue around her because she's glowing? And I need more information on, the, is she glowing? Why is she glowing? I don't know. It's just not enough information to make any assessment. Like, what's she like? You know, what's her personality like? If I would give these kind of things to my son, it's not enough to just go, oh, she, she radiates. It's like, well, that's, that sounds real nice until it's radiating because she's from, like, Three Mile Island. Or, so there's more to it, and I need more information if I'm going to make smart decisions. Often we're blinded in and of ourselves, and it requires more input than just me feeling like, you know, I, I'm, I'm the adult in this situation, and I got this, and I'm going to, I don't need other people's input, and I'm smart enough, and I'm, I'm wise, and I got this. I got it figured out. It's like, mm, probably not. Uh, we had a, a few years back was Father's Day, and Father's Day is coming up in, in a couple weeks. There's still time to get uh, my dad something super awesome and expensive. And it was Father's Day at the church, and we wanted to give out a little something. And Pastor McDonald Sr., the Bishop McDonald, was doing this thing on stress and relieving pressure. And we thought, oh, it would be fun to give people, like, a tire pressure gauge. And it's like, that's a great idea. Um, and so for whatever reason, it landed on Vince McLaren to take care of that. And I suck at that kind of stuff. But I'm like, you know, I'm like, yeah, I got this, boss. Like, no problem. Let me, I got this sorted out. We'll make sure everything works. The... Graphic is nice. The words are all good. And I just ran with it, and I did, the, did it myself. I put the, the image that I thought was, would be good, the words I thought would be good, didn't get anybody to check anything, signed off on the final copy, the one that ends up going to the, the company that prints these things onto the tire pressure gauge. Everything's great. I'm the man. I'm the dude, I figured, I did it all by myself, sourced the company, figured it all out, communicated with them, got the thing, church colors, woo! I'm feeling it. One little detail is because I did every last little bit myself, I also put the wrong church website on and sent everybody to calvary.com, which is some church in the States. I don't even know if it's a cult. I, I don't know what it is. But I sent everybody there, calvary.com, on the pressure gauge because our address is calvary.ca. And you'd think I'd know that, seeing as how I'm the one who selected it. When you're relying on yourself for everything, you're like, oh, you're, too, oh, you're, just, gonna, you're just gonna take it all on yourself. Are you gonna not get any input from anybody? The encouragement from the Proverbs is don't do it. Talk to people. Put some trust out there. 
Put some, put, you know, that extra measure. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Sometimes we don't put stuff out there because we want to kind of prove ourselves or, you know, we want to, uh, you know, give the uh, illusion that we have every last thing together. It doesn't mean you have to take every last bit of advice, but if you don't have the knowledge to work from, you're just going to make poor choices. That's just how that goes. You're getting more pieces of information. And so the encouragement from Solomon in through this proverb is get lots of people around you with different perspectives. I don't have to agree with them all. I don't have to love them all or say, you know, because you're here, I'm going to choose you. But you do need to hear from a variety of people, particularly when you're making uh, big choices. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier, marriage or homes or these sorts of things. Get people around you and get some input. Don't feel like you got to run this race alone. Well, we're excited for the next upcoming a few weeks, and Pastor Steve will uh, undoubtedly be uh, jumping in some more from there. But let me pause and pray for you. Now, uh, maybe one of these particular Proverbs twinged off something within you, and overall you're like, well, maybe that one wasn't for me, but I know that there's more coming, so hang tight. But if one of those things hit you, I want to pray for you right now. Yeah, that the Lord would work out something. Don't beat yourself up. We're all working through things. No one's perfect. Don't beat yourself up. Yeah, the Lord's not done with you yet. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you for my friends working through the things that they're working through. We'd ask, Lord, you would grant wisdom in the same way you teach us in James that if any one of us lacks wisdom, that you would grant it to us liberally. Lord, we need to hear from you. We need to hear from your word. We need to hear from your people. Lord, we need to hear from you, however you choose to speak to us. Lord, and in particular in these areas, Lord, for whatever my friends might be needing today, supply it according to your riches and glory in Christ. We want to hear from you this upcoming week as we are transformed to be more and more like you each day. We ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. As a final act of worship, we want to give you the opportunity to worship God with your tithes and offerings. This is a chance for all of us to honor God with what he's given us. And as you give, it's because of the generosity of our entire Calvary family that our ministry remains strong and we're able to continue to partner with local missions, national organizations, and international missions, including supporting the Ukrainian Relief Fund. So if you would like to partner with us and donate today, you can do so by following the information at the bottom of the screen and giving is safe and easy. Before you go, I'd like to pray for you and your giving. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for every giver and for every gift. And we pray that you would take the, the, the funds that come in and multiply them and use them to the furthering of your kingdom. We pray that we would see miracles done through uh, the, the building of your kingdom in both here at home and abroad, and that we would see lives changed. Lord God, we, we pray for the situation as it continues in the Ukraine, that you would bring peace and comfort to the people in that situation. We love you so much, and we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. In your name, amen. Thank you for joining us today, everyone, and we'll see you next week for Calvary Church Online. <laughs>